everyone and welcome back to another episode with me today with Dr Lucia, otherwise known as Lucinda. I'm a GP based in Sydney, Australia, originally from the UK and basically what I'm here to talk to you about today is something called an academic exemption and this is basically for you GPs out there who are wondering how to stay in a CBD practice within Australia without having to change jobs every six months. This is a little loophole that I found out about um, not too long ago when I went to a conference and had a chat with some other overseas trained GPs uh, who are also on this 10 year moratorium and had found this way of getting an academic exemption with the university to teach medical students, which enabled them to stay long term in GP practices that otherwise they'd have to move every six months from for that 10 year moratorium. If you want to know a bit about the moratorium, please refer to a previous video of mine where I explain it all in a lot of detail. When it comes to uh, applying for an academic exemption, it's usually not too difficult if you're doing a normal GP role. In my situation, it was a little bit different because at the moment I'm doing pure skin cancer and surgery work. Uh, but generally speaking, a lot of GP surgeries have already had medical students in, so they tend to already have uh, associations with certain medical schools. But if they haven't, what you need to do is have a little look at, I'll share like a list down below um, about the universities that are associated with getting this academic exemption. But you just basically need to contact them. So I sent through emails, called people until I found a university that was happy to take me on. And like I said, normally, if you're doing a normal GP role, you really won't have any issues with this whatsoever. But in my case, because I was doing pure skin cancer as a GP, it looked like no university had actually done this before in Sydney. And so I was really losing hope until I got in touch with University of New South Wales and met up with a wonderful GP educator who leads uh, the medical students for their GP rotations. He agreed to do this thing with me where I get to share medical students who are already doing their GP placements with other GP surgeries. And they would then have a day within their eight week rotation of sitting in with me in my clinic. And so I would then sort of have a different uh, medical student a day for two days a week for four weeks. And I do basically four of those kind of um, four week blocks uh, a year. And so I was really grateful for this because they had never done this before. And if they hadn't, then I don't think anyone else <laughs> was going to allow it, which would mean that I would not have been able to continue working in this specific medical centre. So there's a couple of requirements that you need in order to be able to apply for an academic exemption. So first of all, you need to have no APRA restrictions. Um, you need to have a fellowship with a medical college that's also accredited with this program as well. So I'll leave a link below to show which medical colleges are accepted for this academic exemption. You obviously also need to have a specialist registration as a GP and what's called an academic appointment by a medical school. So for me personally, the whole process of finding a medical school that was going to accept me took about two months. But again, it's a unique situation, whereas I think it would not take an anywhere near as long in order to, to get that if you were doing a normal GP role. Something really important to bear in mind is that an academic exemption does not apply if you're doing purely private practice. So in my situation, I'm, I'm doing mixed billing um, or bulk billing, and so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Now, something that's also good to bear in mind is that if your GP surgery has specific accreditation, you can actually get paid for having medical students. Uh, and that's about $200 for three hours. And you get that sort of, you get two sessions a day maximum that you can claim for. It doesn't matter how many medical students you have with you. Uh, so you can only claim for a maximum of, of $400 basically per day. In my situation, my practice is not accredited and it's quite a palaver in order to get accreditation. But normally speaking, GP surgeries, they'll have accreditation there. And I'll also leave a link about um, getting accreditation if it's something that you're interested in looking into. <laughs> All right, so what do you do next? So you've signed up with the university to get medical students. You've gone through the whole process of sending your CV. They've accepted it. All's looking good. You've got medical students booked in. This is all taking a little bit of time. 
when can you finally get um, a letter and then apply for an academic exemption? So basically the conditions of the university I was with, which I suspect will probably be the same for all other universities, is that you have to have had um, a rotation of medical students, so the four week block um, to show that you are dedicated and you are officially working alongside with the university. And once you've done that, that's when you can apply for something called a conjoint title. You basically get a name like professor or associate professor or something like that associated with the university. And that's when you can ask for a letter of support from the university um, to actually do then the academic application. Um, now, the actual process of doing that took roughly about two weeks because this letter of support also has to be signed by the dean or a senior medical officer. And what they do is that they actually put down the date specifically on the letter for how long you're going to be appointed with that university, which is normally for about a year. <laughs> Now, just a little bit about having medical students as well, because I think it's really important to understand what you're getting yourself into. When I have medical students in, what I do is I give them a little presentation when they come in. Um, so obviously this does mean blocking time off my scheduled clinics, because I also want to make sure I'm doing a good job and not just having them in clinic to just watch what I do. You know, they are medical students at the end of the day, and this is, you know, I, I treat them how I would have liked to have an experience, if that makes sense. So I give them a presentation about uh, most common skin cancers and also the, the important role of a GP in Australia when it comes to skin cancer management and diagnosis, basically. And then throughout the clinic, I get them involved in the patient care. Obviously, you're going to have to make sure that the patients are happy to have a medical student in with them. And I sort of ask them, do you notice any weird lesions there at all? Or having a look at the dermatoscope, which is that magnifying um, instrument and most of them have never looked into a dermatoscope before. And I just try and get them to be creative and just ask them, you know, what can you see? Just describe anything and nothing can sound wrong or, or bad or anything like that. With these medical students, they, they've actually applied to come in to sit in with me in clinic specifically. So it's not a mandatory kind of part of their, um, of their sort of GP rotation. Um, so they've got a special interest in, in skin cancer or dermatology, basically. Um, so I get them to help really assist me with procedures and if they're really proficient, confident and got the patient's consent, I'll get them to do maybe a local anaesthetic, for example. And then in the afternoon, I'll get them to do, um, I'll, I'll sit down with them and do a suturing tutorial um, on some things that I bought from Amazon, which are really helpful, and then continue on with the clinic and get them to get involved as much as they can, as long as the patient's happy with that as well. And they've really enjoyed their experience, which is really great. And it, it's good to know that GP in Australia is extremely diverse, like there's more than 30 subspecialities that you can get yourself into. All right, so you've got your letter of support, you're ready to apply for this academic exemption. So how do you actually do it? So the 19AB application that you had to do to get this current job, you do that same 19AB application, but this time when you go on to question one, you need to select reopen application and put down the number that you've currently got for this specific practice. And then the rest is exactly the same. And thankfully you can now do this electronically because I had one whirlwind of a time when I tried to apply for my current practice before and the application got lost in the post, the whole thing had to be reapplied and oh, there were so many issues and the whole thing then took actually three months to go through, which was an absolute hoo-ha. Now that they've got an email, I send it to two emails, I'll put them in the description as well. You then get an automated response saying, we have received your email and it will be responded to appropriately. But what I would recommend is something that I did, um, is that I called them, um, I'll also leave the number here as well, I called them every Monday and Friday to check up on the application, to make sure there are no issues, make sure there's nothing wrong, see how the application is going. Because what I found in the last time that I sort of did a general application is that there was something missing or they couldn't find this or something went lost. And the thing is, by the time they send you a letter in the post to inform you of this, it is potentially been a week or two because of delays of postal stuff and whatever. So it's good to just call them and then be able to act on it faster basically. 
when you do call the Medicare provider registration team, um, you can come across some change in times and dates uh, for when your application can be processed. Now they can't actually give you uh, an exact date of how long it's going to take, but they tell you roughly it's going to take 20 working days or etc, something like that. But in my scenario, every time I called them, I found that the date was, was shifting further and further into the future. So from 20 working days to 25 working days from the point of um, putting through the application. So in my personal situation, it took a month for the application to completely be approved. If you've got, which you should really, if you've been working in Australia already, you should have a Proda online account. You can see any registrations that you've had or currently have. And so when your application's actually been successfully processed or declined, you can see it there automatically. So that gets updated straight away. Whereas Medicare say that they do actually send you a letter in the post to confirm that your registration number has been approved or not. Um, I personally haven't had that letter come through, um, but they say it takes roughly about two weeks to do so. <laughs> When I first put in my application to apply for my current job, I put on the date that I wanted to start work. Um, say that was um, the 8th of August, for example. And I'd never worked there before, and so I'm waiting and waiting for this application to go through. And say the application then came in on the 20th of August. So for me, that's when I'm like, okay, cool, I can start work now, today, tomorrow, or whatever. But actually, if you look at your application, uh, just pay big attention onto the date that they've actually written that you can start working there. The date that you've asked to start working at that practice is when they actually start, um, not when they've ended up approving it. So in my situation, when it came to me renewing my application and putting this academic exemption application through, I then realised, oh my gosh, I've got two weeks less time than what I thought I did because they put down the time that uh, the date that I wanted to start work, not the date that I actually got approved. And the other interesting thing is that if you're coming close towards the end of um, the six months, and um, for whatever reason, you haven't been able to put the application through for the academic exemption or the further, you know, with the 19AB application. When I spoke to Medicare, what they said is that, say for example my last day of work was actually the 7th of august right but i want to start i want to continue working i don't have any breaks so technically you can put in your new application form even though say for example you've you've you, <laughs> you know it's going to take a month for it to go through and you've just realized this on like in the in the end of july and you're like oh no okay so i want to work continuously on so i'll do it from the 8th of august knowing that my last day is technically the 7th so what medicare said to me is that you can technically continue working even though it's actually expired after the 7th of august but you just can't bill anyone yet until your application's been approved. Now, usually the applications do get approved with academic exemption. I haven't heard of any sort of bad experiences alongside it. So if you've got all the right paperwork, you know, it really should go through. So you technically could continue working and then hold all of your billings and then process all of those billings um, once, you know, your application's been successful. Now, in my scenario, it's a little bit complicated because I was in a mix, I'm in a mixed billing practice. And so what that would mean is that reception would have to call every single patient that would have to privately bill on top of the Medicare billing and get them to do that payment. And so that, you know, can you imagine like weeks of patients? That is a lot of admin and um, yeah, it just seemed like it would just be too complicated. And because I hadn't been through this process myself, I was also second guessing, is this actually going to go through? Or have I just spent the last four weeks working for free? Um, but now I can say, you know, it's a high rate of success <laughs> of, of this application going through. Or you can have a holiday, whatever you like. <laughs> Lastly, some other perks that I didn't 
really know came in an academic world with a university is actually access to program software. So for example, with University of New South Wales, I've got access to something called the Creative Cloud, which enables me to download and use programs from, for example, Adobe and Microsoft, which is really, really awesome um, because I love uh, making you know fun looking presentations and information leaflets and things like that. And the other thing is, is access to the university's journal library. So when I'm sort of trying to look up from, you know, up to date information or journals um, with X, Y and Z, I've got access to all of that now. So I hope that answers the majority of any questions anyone has. Like I certainly didn't have any clue about how this academic exemption process all works, but it's a lot easier than you think it is, especially if you're doing a general um, GP role. It's a little bit more creative if you're if you're not like myself, um, but it is possible. And so if you do have any more questions about any of that at all or any suggestions for any future videos, I'll do my best to get into creating those when I've got time in between work and life and everything like that. Um, and yeah, thank you for watching this video and I hope you guys all have a lovely rest of your day. Take care.